joy to be here and we're approaching um, Christmas and uh, it's, uh, it's that time of year again, isn't it? Where we think, have we done everything that we need to do? No, not sure. Um, but we are looking forward to a little bit of a a break, I think, and a bit of a rest in January, so it's good. Right, praise the Lord. Let's just uh, commit the word to the, of the Lord to his care. Heavenly Father, we approach your word. We pray that you will let it be with clarity, and certainly we ask your Holy Spirit, would you come and anoint our ears as much as, our, as my words and our hearts to receive, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So our verse today is uh, verse 32. Uh, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So in summary, Paul gives us, I believe, the keys without actually saying this is where it's going to, the rubber is going to hit the road. He gives us keys in verse 31 and 32. Let, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, or as I said, as God in Christ forgave you. And I'd like to suggest that the heart of this message and the very center of our relationship with God hangs on this very verse. And our relationship with, our, with one another is actually exactly the same. Now, the heart of my, uh, or the, the, the center of my focus in all of this is the new covenant that God has made in Christ and his blood. And I think one of the things is, uh, in the church is not a full appreciation of the power of the new covenant and, why, and our relationship with God. So I want to talk about the new covenant. And it's found in prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 31 and it's repeated in Hebrews chapter 8, which we've studied. But let me read in Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 and just focus on a few key points of what God promised to do in Christ. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So that was the covenant God made with Israel through Moses. So we call it Moses' covenant or the, what the New Testament calls the Old Covenant in Hebrews. So this new covenant is not like the Old Covenant. It's not like the covenant that I made. And we need to define what the differences are and how it is not like that covenant. Which covenant they break. Listen, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. So it was a marriage covenant that God had made with Israel and he was their husband and they were his wife. But he said they broke the covenant. He never broke the covenant. They broke the covenant and made it null and void. So he divorced Israel. But this, he says, this is a new covenant. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. And here's the promise upon which this covenant is made. And this covenant was made as, as Jesus revealed at the Last Supper. He sat down and he said, this is the new covenant 
in my blood. So the new covenant was made in the blood of Jesus. And he refers to this new covenant. And then he says an interesting thing. A new commandment I give you. So this covenant is not like the old. The old covenant had its laws and its promises and its curses and its blessings. But the new covenant is not like the old covenant. And Jesus made it very, he made it very clear. He said, I, and a new commandment I give you. You know what? He never sat there at that table when they were having that meal and, giving, and he never gave them 613 laws. He never sat down and said, well, you must pay your tithes on time and you must be at the prayer meeting at 6 o'clock in the morning and you must uh, this and that and that and, and you must do this and you must do that. And A new commandment I give you. New covenant, new commandment. In the book of Hebrews it says, with the, with the new priesthood comes a new law. And Paul refers to this law, the law of Christ. And we talked about that last time too. Bear one another's burdens, he said in one place. And so fulfill the law of Christ. A new commandment I give you. That you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. So here's the promises of the new covenant in Jeremiah. Number one, I will put my law in their inward parts. I shall write it on their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. And here's the, here's, the, here's the bottom line. And here's the cruncher. And here's the key. And here's the pivot on which all of the new covenant stands. For I will forgive their iniquity. And there, I will remember their sin no more. How radical is that? I'll tell you how radical it is because if you quickly jump over to Hebrews, which we've, which we've studied at length, in chapter 10, listen to this. The law, Moses' law, having a shadow of good things to come, and this is the good thing. And not the very image of these things. It's a shadow. It wasn't the image. It was the shadow. Can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. But, verse 3, in those sacrifices, there is remembrance again made of sins every year. Can you see how radical this new covenant that God has made? As Jesus said, in my blood. That's why the communion is the, is the, is the symbol, if you like, or the, the celebration of the new covenant. The Old Covenant says, every time you sacrifice, you will remember your sins every year. And all it did was to cover those sins as they looked towards the ultimate sacrifice, the complete and finished sacrifice of the Son of God. And in that shedding of his blood, he fulfills his promise, I will forgive you all the iniquity that has brought death into this world, all the sin that has separated you from God, I will forgive and I will remember it no more. So just a few thoughts on the new covenant. As I said, it's not like the former covenant. And he's very specific in Jeremiah, the covenant that was made 
when, you, when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. He's not talking about the covenant he made with Abraham. Because that carried promises that reached way past the law to the day when the seed should come, Paul says in Galatians. And that seed is Christ. Secondly, we need to understand that that covenant was broken because they were not faithful. Number three, we need to understand that the covenant relationship that God had with Israel was as a husband. But you note what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, if you read it, he describes the law as being married to a husband who has dominion and requires absolute obedience. Isn't that right, Terry? <laughs> this law, he says, killed them. Mm, sometimes a husband who demands absolute obedience is a killer. Paul said this, the law came, sin revived, and I died. In 2 Corinthians, Paul calls the law written on stone the ministration of death. And to the Galatians, he says, why was the law added? Why did God give the law to Israel? To make sin absolutely sinful. Now, the law is good. It's good. It reflects the very holiness of God. But it was only a shadow of that which to come. And that which was to come was Jesus. And he's the one that all his glory cast that shadow. And the law only reflected this little bit of a sense of the holiness of God. The holiness of God, the character of God is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says it. Look, in the old times God spoken to the fathers by the prophets. In these last days he has spoken unto us in the person of his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his Father's glory and the effluence, effluence, the outshining of the Father, the very stamp, the very seal, the very image of God in the flesh. He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite is grace, and emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Wesley never used two words where one would do. Absolutely fantastic exposition of this whole thing of the incarnation that we are now approaching at Christmas. He left his father's throne, became born a man, born a baby. Next, God says in the new covenant, I'll write my law on our inward parts and write it on our hearts. Now, what law is he writing? Is he writing the Ten Commandments? No, because the Ten Commandments were only a shadow. They're only a mere, a mere foggy, reduced image of what it meant to be God. Forever his word is settled in heaven, not on tables of stone. So when God writes his law, I think it was uh, John uh, Newton that wrote, write your new name on my heart. That name is love. Fifthly, he, he said, I will be your God and you will be my people. As much as he has become our God in Christ, so we become his people. In Christ, we are that new nation, that holy nation, that royal priesthood. Seventhly, now this is possibly overlooked by a lot of people. The law written on our hearts, it says, and they will all know me from the least to the greatest. What's he saying? You see, Israel, when the, when the law came, Israel were what you call a mixed multitude. People would come in to Israel and they could become a part of Israel, but they're not true Israelites. Paul says to the, I think it's to the Galatians, he said, not all Israel are Israel. For, for it is in, 
Isaac shall our seed be called. In other words, the son of promise. And what's he saying? He's saying that Israel was a mixed multitude. Folks, the church is not a mixed multitude. Now, there may be people in the church who pretend to be Christians who aren't, but they're not in the church. The real church is those who know the Lord from the least of them to the greatest of them. Whether you be the humble, you know, consider yourself low class or, or a king. Whether it be, be the king or whether it be the man who sweeps the streets. The least to the greatest in the eyes of the world shall all know me. That's a promise that's given in the new covenant which shows us that the church is not a mixed multitude though it may have people in it pretending. And the why and the how, for I will forgive their sins. And this reconciles us to God because it was sin that separated us from God. Behold, my hand's not short that it cannot save, and my arm, you know, extended that it, that it cannot rescue. Isaiah said, But your sins have made a separation between you and your God. And I want to, God says, I want to get rid of that separation. I want to forgive your sins. And it's on the basis of forgiveness. So now Jesus becomes the end of the law unto righteousness, Paul says in Romans chapter 10. And if God the Father was married and now divorced, making the old covenant null and void, what is this law that God has written on our hearts? Romans 7 verse 4. My brethren, ye also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that we should be married to another. You didn't get divorced from God, Israel, to be just a loner. But God wants to lift you from the dead and marry you to a new husband. Even to him, Paul says, who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So we're married to Christ. He becomes our beloved. The marriage of the Lamb. And so to the Corinthians... Paul said to them that without law I became as one without law, but not being without law to God. So I'm, it's not antinomianism that I'm preaching. It's not that we are without law, but we are under a law of Christ. But under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that were without law. In Romans chapter 13, verse 8, listen to what Paul says here. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Romans 13, verse 10. Love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So here's our relationship with God, the new commandment, love one another. I read a commentary and made this statement and it really triggered me. Every religion acknowledges the value of forgiveness, but only Christianity commands it. This is a commandment. This is a commandment. And as I studied, I searched high and low. And you know what? The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, had very little to say about interpersonal forgiveness in relationships. For it focuses more on sacrifice to cover sins before God. So if you read the Old Testament, you know, bring your lamb, bring, bring your goat, bring your bull, shed some blood. Why? To cover your sins before God. And there were some laws, of course, about reconciliation, about paying back. But there's very little focus on interpersonal relationships because God dealt with it as a nation. Now that in the new covenant, it's every man, every woman, from the least to the greatest. There's a very, there's a very personal relationship that's developed. 
in this new covenant. God loves everyone, every individual. But then he puts us in a body and he commands us. He commands. It's not optional. Oh, I don't like them. I'll get away from them. Yeah, it's, oh, no way. It's a commandment. Love one another. And here Paul says, how do you love one another? You forgive one another. Why? Because offences come. There's always somebody to offend you. There's always somebody to hurt you. There's always somebody to do you wrong. And, 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 and if it was all nice and rosy and all the rest of it, you would never have your love challenged. So in forgiveness, God says, this is how I do it, God says. He says, I'll forgive you, and then I will cast all your transgressions away. And I'll never bring them to mind. That's a very tall order, and that's a very hard commandment, but that is the commandment of the new covenant. This is the law. Matthew 18, and I'll just go through this and then um, finish. Peter came to Jesus and said, you know this so well. Peter comes to Jesus and he says, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? Oh, generous, Peter, aren't you generous? Because you see, under the old covenant, there was this thing of paying back and retribution and things like that. Jesus says, come on, you're coming into a new covenant. You're coming into a new relationship. Not seven times, Peter. Seventy times seven, which causes... He's not saying 490 times and then you don't forgive him. He's, just, he's going, he's taking a number. Seventy times seven. It's a ridiculous number. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king who would like to take an account of his servants. Now he began to reckon one was brought to him which owed him 10,000 talents. I don't know what that translates to in terms of money, but it's a lot. For as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. See? Justice, retribution. The servant fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. The Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So legalism cuts in here because there's no way that God can forgive the debt of sin that we owe except it's been paid for. And this is what we call penal substitution in the atonement which as I understand is a doctrine that many are just trying to toss out because they say God is love and he can do this without any substitution but no God is also holy and he's just so understand this man this king was moved with compassion and forgave him the debt but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants that owed him a hundred pence and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat <laughs> Pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Isn't it? Really? He repeated exactly the same thing that this guy had just been forgiven. But he went and he cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So his fellow servants saw what was done. They were very sorry and came and told their Lord what was done. So watch out, because in the body of Christ, we used to call it community concern, but it tended to be gossip. There's always somebody who will snitch on you, because what, is, what did the writer of Hebrews say? Be careful, let any root of bitterness spring up in you. Many become defiled. And this is the other thing about unforgiveness. And bitterness, it develops bitterness. That's why Paul says to the Ephesians, let all malice go. Let all of these things go. You've got to let them go. If someone's hurt you or offended you, there's a means, there's a way to fix it. Don't.
Don't let it fester until your bitterness is the root that's in your heart grows up and defiles many around you. Many get upset, many get offended. His fellow servants saw what was done and they went and told the Lord. Then his Lord, after he called him, said unto him, You wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. Verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother and their trespasses. And Jesus brings it right home to his disciples. And he said, this is the story I've told, but you better watch it, believe it. My heavenly Father will do also to you if you don't forgive from the heart everyone who has trespassed against you. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. Right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, right in the middle of the New Covenant, New Covenant law, forgive one another. It's not optional. It's what you do if you're a Christian. And so I just throw out the challenge. You might just want to pause, bow your head, and say, Lord, is there, is there any name that you want to bring to me right now of something or someone I need to forgive? I need to go through the proper means if it causes more trouble than healing to go and speak to a person, you forgive in your heart. If it's causing a conflict, whether it's in the family or in the church, you deal with it appropriately. But I want to finish with a little thing I read, which I thought was really interesting, and you may want to consider this, concerning this whole thing of how a bitter spirit can defile many. Dr. Stephen Standiford, Chief of Surgery at the Cancer Treatment Centres of America, said this, Unforgiveness is now classified in medical books as a disease. Refusing to forgive makes people sick and keeps them that way. With that in mind, there's something now called, that's developing amongst some of these, tre uh, some of these treatment places. And, you know, you may have heard of John Hopkins and, and, and um, the Mayo Clinic. It, it's a div diverse range of, 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 of therapy, healing places. With that in mind, forgiveness therapy is now being used to help treat diseases such as cancer. This is an emerging understanding of something that's been in the Bible for 2,000 years. Quote, it is important to treat emotional wounds or disorders because they really can hinder someone's reactions to treatments. Even someone's willingness to pursue treatment, as Standiford, Standiford explained. Of all cancer patients, 61% have forgiveness issues. And of those, more than half are severe, according to the research by Dr. Michael Barry, who's written a book called the Forgiveness Project, I only read a review of it on Amazon as I was doing some research. Dr. Michael Barry, he is a pastor, and he says this, harboring these negative emotions, this anger and hatred creates a state of chronic anxiety, he said. Chronic anxiety very predictably produces excess adrenaline and cortisol, which deplete the production of natural killer cells which is your body's foot soldier in the fight against cancer, he explained. Barry said the first step in learning to forgive is to realise how much we have been forgiven by God. 
When a person forgives from the heart, which is the gold standard we see in Matthew 18, which is what I've just read, forgiveness from the heart, we find that they are able to find a sense of peacefulness. Quite often our patients refer to that as a feeling of lightness, he said. Barry said most people don't realise what a burden anger and hatred were until they let them go. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the clarity of the words of Jesus. That you would help us today focus on what it means to be a new covenant Christian. Teach us, Lord, we pray. And if there are any here today, myself included, who are holding a grudge or unforgiveness over any offence, over any transgression, whether it be small or large, we pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would be so encouraged that we should respond and forgive, even as you have forgiven us our trespasses. In Jesus' name, 